We will be concluding 1 Timothy. Um, this is the first letter written to him. There is a second, um, and we will be finishing up this morning with the first train of thought and what Timothy was to be instructed by Paul, the first round, so to speak. And so we are going to be concluding that this morning. Uh, this morning is going to be definitely us just reading the charges and that we might one by one go through them. And so let's begin to read. It's 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 21. It says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from the reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradiction of what is falsely called knowledge, for by professing it some have swerved from the faith. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your words. We thank you for the word of God. Lord, we pray that this morning it might speak to us, that we might take this letter written to Timothy from Paul as biblical instruction for our lives. Lord, that we might see the context and that we might also see the application. And so, Lord, we pray that you be with us now as we do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what we have here is Paul now just ending his letter that he is writing to Timothy. Uh, he's giving him his final words, his last thoughts. Um, I don't believe uh, there's nothing to tell us in the way he ended it that Paul thought he was going to write a second letter. Um, but what we see here is potentially if this was the only one, this is how he desired to end it. Uh, in much of the way, he was going back to some things he already mentioned. He's talking again about false teachers. He's talking again about those who are rich and those who are in Christ who are rich. Um, he is talking about Timothy fighting the good fight against heretics and those who are wavering from their belief. And then once again, he tells young Timothy a few things to once again put on and add on to himself. Uh, he's already told him, 1 Timothy 4.12, do not any, anyone despise you because you are young, but put an example forth in your speech, in your conduct, in your faith, in your life, your purity. And here again, now he's adding on a few more things for Timothy to put on. But what we see here is the way that he closes it is, is a perfect way to wrap up the instruction that he has been giving to Timothy. And I hope and pray that it will also be instruction for us to apply to our lives this morning. So if you're taking notes on the inside of our bulletin this morning, the very first thing that we see is this. Number one is we must always be prepared to fight the good fight of faith. We must always be prepared to fight the good fight of faith. In the closing statements that he makes to Timothy, Paul instructs him that the life of a disciple of Jesus is a good fight. It's a fight worth fighting for. Now, I know for some of us, we might not like that language. We might not like the idea that we're calling the Christian life a fight, because uh, maybe for some of us, we're more adverse to that, and we, we don't like to fight. But the truth of the matter is what we look about in the Old Testament and the New Testament is we see that the life of a Christian is one of spiritual warfare, one of battle, one where it is challenging. It's a day-by-day -day task that it continues to wear on you. It continues to tear. It continues to present good and bad all within the same hour. And what we see is that we are called to be prepared to fight this good fight. It is continual. So the day that we expire, what we see is that this fight will continue on. Eventually will have its end. But for now, this fight of faith is all-consuming. 
Some of us here, we know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of us here, you know exactly what Paul is talking about. You know for your life that absolutely, you're like, this is a fight. It really is. I've been in battle. I have scars to prove it. I have a, a potential spiritual limp to prove it. Like, I have been through it. But yet, through it all, what I can continue to stand upon is Jesus continues to get me through it. And this is what Paul is trying to instruct to Timothy. He's like, Timothy, whether you know you're in a battle or not right now, I'm here to tell you, you are in one. I know for us, as we kind of look at the news and we look around, I know right now we're not in this active state of, of wartime. We, we look at things with Iran. You always look at things Russia and China, parts in North Africa, civil war. You look all around the world. But the reality of the Christian is that we are in active wartime at all times. We are always at wartime. We are always to be prepared for this spiritual battle that is upon us. What we see is we are called to fight this good fight, and it is continual. I want to read for us this morning a passage of Scripture that I'm sure if you've been in church for some time, you, you've heard before. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. And this is Paul, uh, once again, talking to the church in Ephesus, and he's trying to encourage them with the same thing he's telling to Timothy. Up here on the screen, this is what it says. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord. I mean, we could stop right there and be done with the sermon. I mean, he says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Don't be strong in you. Don't be strong in what you have. Don't be strong in your gain, your wealth. Don't be strong in those things, but rather, finally, he says, be strong in the Lord. As if there is anything or any other person to be strong in. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having you the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I, Paul, am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is Paul just telling the church, he's like, church, you need to prepare for battle. You need to have this armor upon you day in, day out constantly it's not like a set of clothing that you put away for the night it's not like you say well, what am I going to wear this morning oh I got these dirty now I must change no Paul's saying this is a daily practice of putting this on every day because every day life presents itself and what we see here many people today in the church have attempted to read out of the Bible angels and demons They've tried to read out of the Bible this kingdom of darkness. They've tried to read out of the Bible the adversary who has many names. He is the ruler of the air, the lowercase god of this world, Satan, devil. People are trying so desperately to read that out of the Bible. But what we see here in Scripture all throughout Old Testament, New Testament, is we are in a spiritual battle. We truly are. Up until our in individual lives and on a greater scale on the church globally, there is a spiritual warfare and battle that is happening. What we see, one of the things I think about often is the extent of the gospel. Why is the gospel in some areas harder to get to than others? Because I 100% believe with all my heart that there is such a stronghold, an evil, demonic stronghold that is not allowing for the gospel to penetrate a people and a country. And that's why we send missionaries like this gentleman, MC, who we can't even know his name because of the place that he is in, that he might extend the gospel there. Because if he doesn't, Satan wins. What we see is that we are in a spiritual battle, and he has called us to gird up and to fight this good fight. 
There was a few more things he said to add on. So not only was Timothy to put on this armor that he's telling in Ephesus, not only was he to put on uh, faith and conduct and good works and his purity and his life, but then Paul said, pursue these things. And he, it's right here in the scripture. He said, pursue righteousness was one of them. He's like, add that on. Put that on you, Timothy. Everybody else can be doing this, but you, disciple of Jesus, put on righteousness. What does that mean? It means upright conduct before others. Handle yourself in such a way that it glorifies Christ. Handle your business, your family, your marriage, your life. Handle your Christian walk in such a way that that conduct before others is upright and your Father in heaven can be glorified. He says also, pursue godliness, meaning having this obedient relationship before God that we would model godliness he's like, Timothy, I know there are people in the church that don't model this. He's like, that's okay. You, Timothy, model godliness. Don't allow for the impact and the effect of other people and what they look like and don't look like and what their Christian life is like and what it's not like and what they are doing or not doing. Instead, he's like, Timothy, you, you model godliness that you might then be able to impact and influence those around you. What else does he say? He tells them to put on faith and love, to trust in God and to be benevolent and have goodwill towards other people. He's like, Timothy, for you, you put on faith. What does that mean? Others are not. He's like, you, Timothy, have trust in God. Live in such a way that people see you trusting in God and in him alone. And by doing so, you might then encourage the faith of others. Timothy, put on love, be benevolent, and show goodwill to other people. Timothy, love. There are others who are not loving. There are those who are to love and are not loving. There are those who are supposed to love within their own household and are not loving. But you, Timothy, you, disciple of Jesus, love. What else does he tell them? He says to put on steadfastness, to have the endurance and the perseverance to fight. I mean, anybody here, have, ever, have you ever felt to give up on something? I don't care what it is. Has anybody ever had that moment? You're just like so there, and you're just like done. You're like, I am done with this. Like, this is so tough. This is so hard. It could have been a job. It could be family. It could be spouse related. It could be so many things. Even this Christian life where so many things just add up and stack up and stack up, and you get to this place to say, you know what? I think I've had enough. And this is where we then root ourselves to say, disciple, be prepared to fight the good fight of faith. Because there will be times and there will be moments where we will say, enough is enough. But then all the more what we do is we trust in Christ who gives us steadfastness, perseverance. There's another uh, word, it's these two words with the hyphen that are connected, long-suffering we see that in the New Testament. This idea of having a long-suffering attitude, steadfastness, saying I can get through this because I have Christ and he is sustaining me through this. What else does he tell them? He says to have gentleness, pursue gentleness. He's telling him to have this so he can deal with the heretics, false teachers, and those who are wavering in their faith. We need to be praying the same for us to say, I need a spirit of gentleness so that when I must talk to somebody who is wavering, somebody who is going this way and strained, someone who's backsliding, that I might be able to be gentle, speak to them, and bring them back to Christ, bring them back this way, and in doing so, saving their soul as James instructed, like we looked at last week. We are spiritual ambassadors for the kingdom of God. One of the things that we see in our own world is we have ambassadors all around. We have U.S. ambassadors, and what they do is they represent us, but somewhere else. Well, here's the thing. We see in the scriptures in, in Corinthians, it talks about that we are all, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you are an ambassador for God's kingdom, meaning you are here representing there. And so you are here representing not your own name and your own self, but you are here in this kingdom to represent a different kingdom that is not of this world. You are not representing your name. You are representing his name. And in doing so, we are ambassadors for Christ. And the sweet part about it is that we are overcomers. We are victorious. The battle's already won. We see that the scorecard has already been set and we have the ending in the book of Revelation. And we don't even need to go to that point. All we have to go to is the cross when Jesus simply said, it is finished. 
And so what we see here is that we must be prepared to fight this good fight. This next thing we see is number two is this, is that the Lord is on our side as we fight our battles. The Lord is on our side as we fight our battles. As we put the armor of God on, may we also rest in this truth. And it's simply this, God is with us and he goes before us. I think for some of us this morning, that might just simply be the encouragement alone that we needed. Just to know this morning that God is with us and he goes before us. It's this idea that we see founded early on when Jesus was coming to this world that his name should be one of them, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. John 1.14 talks about this idea of him dwelling among us, and he has chosen to make his dwelling with us, that we would not be distant from him, that we would no longer have to come to a place to have the presence of God, but that the physical manifestation of God would be here, walk this earth, and then when he would rise again, put the spirit of God so that way constantly God is in us. That is what God has done through the work of of Jesus, not only is he with us, but he goes before us. He goes before us in all things. Not only that, but we can also find further rest in what we call incommunicable attributes of God. This is big systematic theology words we use, communicable and incommunicable. Communicable means these are certain attributes that God has that we also have. God is loving, we can also love. But then we see there's incommunicable attributes. There are things that only God is that we are not. And Timothy outlines these, or Paul does, and this is what he says. One of them was he said, he is the only sovereign king of kings and lord of lords. That is something that God is that you are not. I know each one of us, we might think we are the king in the household, but I'll ask your wife, and it might be a different story. But we think we might be the king of kings, right? This is my kingdom, my world. This is my recliner, my remote control, whatever it might be, right? We're the king of kings. And Lord, well, here's the thing. There's only one king of kings, only one Lord of lords, and him alone is sovereign. What does that mean? Well, that means that he has all authority over all powers, It's not like just one little area or one little space or one country or one city or one universe or dimension of all of the external, eternal idea of the universe that is expanding. It's like, no, over every stretch of all of it, he has dominion and power over everything. And him alone, he is sovereign, king of kings, lord of lords. What else did Paul say? Paul said, he who alone has immortality. He who alone has immortality. This other word we could use is he has a deathlessness about him. Deathlessness. That in him, he is self-existent. He has no beginning. He has no end. You and I have a beginning and an end. We don't know when our end will come. We did not have a choosing in our beginning. But what we see is that God himself has no beginning, has no end. Revelation later on says, I'm the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He alone who has immortality. That God is on our side when we fight battles. What was the next one that Paul said? He who dwells in unapproachable light. He who dwells in unapproachable light. God is so infinitely holy that no human being can see him and live. God in his most purest form, we see in John 4 that says God is spirit. And so in that, in his most full, purest form, we see that no one can approach God because he is infinitely holy. But then we see the good news of the gospel is that God in the person of Jesus stepped down that we might be able to see the fullness of God in a person. And what we see is as he came in the flesh, we were now able to have that barrier broken down where before we were like Moses. If we were able to get too close and all of a sudden we saw just the back of God, it would go ahead and be too much power for us. It's unapproachable because we are so not infinitely holy. But now because of the work of Jesus... We can come boldly before the throne, and we can come into the very presence of the Father. What was once unapproachable, now we are beckoned to come. And this is the God who fights 
our battles, who is beside us even now. The rock of ages helps fight our battles and keeps us steadfast. Some of us this morning, you just need to hear that word. You just need to hear the word steadfast. You just need to hear this encouragement and just this challenge to you this morning to say this, just remain steadfast. It might be difficult, it might be hard, it might be tough, it's unique from the person sitting next to you to the person behind you, and I know at times it feels overwhelming and all-consuming, but the Lord is on your side and he helps fight your battles. He's omniscient, he knows everything. He's omnipresent, he's everywhere at all times. He's omnipotent, he's all-powerful. And what we see here is him and him alone has immortality. He has never tasted death and he never will. He doesn't have a beginning or an end. That God, in eternal in his nature and weight, is saying, I am here to fight with you and for you. And even sometimes you don't know, but I'm carrying you. This is the God that we serve and that Paul wanted to instruct Timothy about. To say, Timothy, this has got to be a hard fight, but you have the Lord in your corner. Next thing, number three, is this. The distraction of riches will weaken our effectiveness in the fight. The distraction of riches will weaken our effectiveness in the fight. As we fight this good fight of faith and have God with us in the fight, we make it our aim of being strong and effective and not distracted by the task set before us. What we see is last week Paul was talking about that to Timothy, about those who were in Christ who are desiring to be rich, he had some words for them. And now he's talking about those who are already in Christ, who already were wealthy and what they should do. And he's telling them to, whatever the case might be, to not be distracted by the main mission that is before you. What is the main mission? Well, the main mission is we have the two greats in the New Testament. One being the great commandment, one being the great commission. And what we see is much like a bike that has two pedals, We see this being the pedals that are before us. On one side, the great commandment. We love God and we love neighbor as ourself. And on the other side, we see this other pedal that we go out, we make disciples, baptize and teach them everything that God has commanded and know that even this, I will be with you to the end of the age. And what we do is we not be distracted and we stay on that bike. We love God, we love neighbor. We go out, make disciples. That means we must go out of our comfort, preach. We must love, share the gospel. Peter later on says what? He says that we, each one of us as a Christian, must be able to defend the hope that is within us. That we must be ready in and out of every season to tell the good news of what God has done for you and what he's continuing to do now and tomorrow and yesterday. That we are to be in and out of every season ready to give that account to someone. What we see is that there's often times as we're riding that bike Much like at times when we might go to a mall or we are very hungry and we're going places, you get so distracted as you're looking side to side to side of all these things around you. Well, one of those things that is so tempting to each of us is this idea of riches and wealth and material gain. But what we must see is that the pursuit of those things and the distraction it causes actually weakens us. It weakens our readiness. Because rather than us day after day putting this armor, rooting ourselves in the word, these things over here, these riches are calling our names and they're calling us away from the word. They're calling us away from family. They're calling us away from the things God has for us. And so what we end up seeing is that it actually weakens our defenses and our offense. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to tell those in the church who already have wealth or or aspiring, what does he tell them? He says this, simply, do good, be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures in heaven. He's telling them, with all that God has given to you, be a blessing. As we said last week, you've been blessed to be a blessing. And what we see here is do not be distracted because if you chase after those things, it has the eventual attempt to weaken your faith And you don't need to be weakened for even a second of this fight. Because if you are simply weakened even for a second, you are vulnerable for an attack. And so the call and the command here is to not be distracted by the riches of this world, for it should weaken us. We are to set our hope and attention on Jesus so that we do not get consumed by the battle nor distracted. Lastly, as we close this morning, the final command and charge that he gave to young Timothy was this. Number four, 
Guard your faith by all means. Guard your faith by all means. This was the last command and call that he finally gave to young Timothy. Guard your faith. What has been deposited and entrusted to you, Timothy, guard it with all your life. This faith that Timothy believed upon was deposited into him by the instruction of many disciples of Jesus. We'll see later in 2 Timothy, two of those was his mother and grandmother. We also see here by the letters, Paul. Paul was the one who brought Timothy with him as we read in the book of Acts. What we see is what would be the greatest sign of gratitude for Timothy's salvation because of the work of what others did. The greatest thing would be to guard his faith by all means. One of the things that I mentioned a few weeks back and it mentioned again this morning in first service was I can think about for me, it's this ongoing generational handling down of the faith. Uh, as my grandmother passed away a few weeks back, it was just such a blessing to see my aunts and uncles uh, as they were up there together and as they were talking about their mom, what was the common theme from them all was the faith that their mother gave to them. And then as I stood up for all of the grandkids and I said now because of their faith and now their faith, now look at my faith and now I'm able to pass that on next to my kids and, and then on. And it's the same thing here Paul is telling Timothy, I have given you something so rich. We've instructed you. We've taught you. We've come alongside of you. We've preached the gospel to you. We've treated you like our own child. Timothy, this faith that you have is so precious. And there will be so many people trying to take it away. There will be people who will try to misconstrue. There will be people who will try to confuse you about your faith. There will be people who will tell you you have no faith. Timothy, if there's anything else that you do as you fight this good fight of the faith is to guard it with everything you have. And one of those measures that we've seen throughout all of 1 Timothy, and it will carry on in 2 Timothy and Titus, it also had the implication for him to include the defense of his faith and his task against false teachers who were misusing their position in the word of God for their own gain. He was calling Timothy to say, protect your faith. Be someone who is about the word of God. I will say this over and over and over again until we finally do it and hear it and get tired of hearing it because then we actually hear it and it's this, the word of God, we must get into the word that it might get into us. There's no other way it happens. It's not like we just become a Christian and all of a sudden the Lord just downloads this program in your mind and you know all the scriptures and you've memorized them all and you know how to go here to there and you know everything there is to know about the Bible. It doesn't work like that. We have to put the discipline in and we must get in the word that the word might then get in to us. And there are so many ways today to do that. And what we see is that we must be in the word so it gets into us. Why? So that we better might be able to guard our faith. I would say from this day even going forward, it's going to be harder and harder and more and more of a task for us to guard our faith because our faith will be attacked. The things that we stand for will be attacked. The word of God itself will be torn down. The word of God itself will be manipulated. The word of God itself will be taken out of context or put into different context. And what we see is we just simply have to guard our faith. And the way that we do that is by letting the word of God get into us. The last thing I want to say, it just goes on a play of words from Timothy, uh, uh, what Paul wrote to him. We guard so that we do not swerve. And we can only do this because of God's grace. I hope and pray that we hear that this morning. We guard so that we do not swerve. We guard so that we do not swerve. What did Timothy learn from Paul? He said, Timothy, for by professing it, meaning false teaching and other things, some have swerved from the faith. We guard that we might not swerve. With that, let me pray this morning.